This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Division of Arts and Humanities at the University of California, San Diego, presents Degrees of Health and Well-Being, a series of public lectures featuring leading faculty from multiple disciplines in history, science, medicine, and social science, each sharing their latest groundbreaking research, impacting the quality of life for you, your family, your region, and your world. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Cheryl Anderson. She is currently associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health. We brought her here from Johns Hopkins in 2012. We're lucky to get her. She received her Master of Public Health at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and her PhD at the University of Washington. You know, when we first came up with the idea for the series this year, we were talking about, you know, let's use degrees of, that sounds like a catchy intro. It was actually Alan Houston's idea last year. Let's, let's keep with that. And why don't we talk about inequality this year? And then somehow we moved into health and well-being. And we thought, well, let's do health and well-being and inequality, too. Wouldn't that make sense? It seemed like kind of a long title for the series. So it's still there. And I think tonight's speaker really exemplifies the combination of these themes. So health and well-being are certainly a focus of her work. You couldn't find a better description of, and more concise description of Professor Anderson's focus than in a profile that was done on her that was up on the homepage, I think, of the UC San Diego website. And the way it was put there was, what if there were a universal prescription for better health, one that could save untold thousands of lives annually, lower health care costs, and even help shrink the nation's carbon footprint? There is. It's called diet and exercise. <laughs> and that seems pretty simple. And it seems that you could easily make a public health career studying diet and exercise and encouraging people to do better on both counts. But Professor Anderson's work moves over into the realm of inequality in this following sense, that she studies nutrition-related issues in disease prevention, specifically in minority and underserved populations. And last summer, when I went to her office to give her the sales pitch, please speak in the series, and happily she agreed, we had a conversation about that. And we're talking about you know, sort of differential risks that you have to your health depending on where you live. And she brought up something that she studies that I had never really thought about before. I thought about, well, you know, the drinking water, factors of that sort over which you might have relatively little control. Choose not to live in Flint, Michigan, for example. But, um, but she talked about areas where the geographical factors are identical for a population, but the socioeconomic factors differ over here from what they are here. And you'll find a much higher incidence of certain types of illnesses over here than over here. So that gives rise to some of Professor Anderson's scientific work. A recent article published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine is called Food Access, Chronic Kidney Disease and Hypertension in the US. And it speaks about the uh, factors such as greater distance from full service supermarkets and low income and how those factors can impair access, I'm reading from the abstract, to healthy diets and contribute to chronic kidney disease. So I think this is something that many of us often don't think about. And tonight, 
Professor Anderson will speaking, be speaking to us about dietary intake and disparities in chronic disease risk, examining the problems and accelerating solutions. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Cheryl Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Cassidy, for that beautiful introduction. And good evening, everyone. It is quite a pleasure for me to be here tonight to further the conversations that we've been having on degrees of health and well being, and doing that through my presentation, which is focused on diet and disparities in chronic disease. So, what I'd like to do is to examine what some of the challenges are when we're thinking about this topic and hopefully leave here tonight um, with you feeling comfortable about your role and the role of the various places in which you intersect in terms of accelerating us to a solution for some of these problems. So, I come to you from uh, background that really began when I was 16 years old in public health and prevention. And I happened to run into um, a professor back when I was in undergrad who really inspired me to do this kind of work. And since then, I've created a research agenda that focuses on nutrition and the prevention of chronic diseases. And I do this um, through three major ways. The first is through observational studies. And in this sense, individuals are recruited into a research program based on a risk factor that they have or an exposure that they share, they're followed over time to see what happens to their health. Simply observational in nature. I also have the pleasure, however, of doing intervention studies, and these could be clinical in nature or in a community setting. And after I have data from a research activity, I'm able to do some translation work, and here, the idea is to take what's been learned um, through research into the community to impact practice, how things are implemented, and hopefully drive policy as well. As Dr. Cassidy mentioned, I work in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health, and it's really exciting to be in the area of public health where a basic goal is to prevent disease and death and try and create and promote environments that really support everyone thriving. So this idea of reduction of health disparities and striving toward health equality is something that's a basic tenet of my, my work life, and I feel really fortunate to have that opportunity. So tonight, I'm going to share with you an example of some of the work that I do, and that's going to be on a project that's aimed at salt reduction. So we'll talk about one of those interventions uh, shortly. But before we do that, I just want to talk about the rationale for my work. So it's nicely summed up in the figure that's on the screen right now, which is sort of hot off the press. It was published three weeks ago by the Institute of Metrics uh, for Health Evaluation from the Global Burden of Disease Program. And what you can see is that the top 10 causes of death are all chronic in nature. Not only are they chronic in nature, but they're preventable. And on the right side of the screen, you see that the risk factors for these preventable causes of death at the very top um, involves dietary risk. When it comes to me being here in San Diego, um, what's happening in San Diego? Well, there's a concept that is used uh, throughout the county called the 3450 concept. And what that describes is a phenomenon that there are three behaviors, those three behaviors being physical inactivity, improper or inadequate diets, and tobacco use that contribute to four diseases, cancer, heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, and lung disease. And these are responsible for more than 50% of the deaths uh, here in San Diego. So this just underscores the type of work that um, my t research team focuses on and the importance of, of looking at these behaviors, particularly diet. So now, before I go much further, I want to introduce the topic of health disparities. How many of you here, by show of hands, work in the area of health disparities or understand health disparities as a construct? Okay, so I see a few. So we we're we're have a, a mixed audience tonight. So health disparities are actually the systematic difference in death and disease that occurs across societal groups. 
Right? And what's interesting about health disparities is that they often happen in socially disadvantaged populations, and they can be geographic in nature, they can be due to racial ethnic uh, group status, they can be due to socioeconomic status, and for some of you, it seems like this is something that you think about quite commonly. For others of you, maybe you've just started thinking about it when you heard about what's happening in Flint, Michigan, where a basic uh, expectation of health isn't be a, being afforded to a community, and you wonder why would that happen in one community while it would probably never happen in another. So the Centers for Disease Control, they have a way of helping us to understand geographic disparities in various health conditions. And I've selected one of the maps that the CDC uh, creates here for obesity because I think it starts to nicely open the conversation around health disparities. So on the screen you see the prevalence of self-reported obesity among uh, adults in the US. And the legend shows us that there are Areas in the U.S. that have, you know, roughly in the 20 to 25 percent range prevalence of obesity, uh, 25 to 30 percent you can see in yellow, and in the red or dark red, greater than 30 percent prevalence of, of obesity. And what's nice is you just have to take a glance at the map to see there are differences by state, and there's even differences, you might say, by regions, with some clustering in terms of where you see yellow, where you see red, and California kind of sits over here on its own um, in green. So relevant to some of the work that I do, I mentioned I'm going to you know, show you some of my work on, on sodium reduction. I'm thinking about cardiovascular diseases and stroke quite often. And here's a map uh, that shows us the differences in stroke death rates across the US um, in various counties. And it's graded, as you see in the legend, um, by light purple down to the darkest uh, purples. And here, you see a concentration of that dark purple or higher uh, rates of death from stroke in the country. And that area has been characterized as the stroke belt. Right? So an interesting geographic disparity um, in health that's characterized here in this map. More so than at any other time in my career, um, we have evidence that place really matters in, in our lives. And in this eye-opening series of, of reports by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they've been showing what can happen over a very short distance within a community. What you see on the screen here are data for New Orleans, Louisiana. And on the left side, the life expectancy is shown for a community by the um, name of Lakewood, where on the right side, we see the life expectancy for a community called uh, Lafitte Trem. These communities are roughly five miles apart with a 25-year difference in life expectancy. And in Lafitte Trem, a, a life expectancy that mirrors what you might see in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I'm not quite sure how that makes you feel, but for me, I find that completely unacceptable, and it really does help to motivate my thinking around some of the work that I do um, in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health. Now, before we go much further, I should acknowledge that chronic diseases are multi-complex and they're um, very complex in their etiology and their multiple causations. And this is a model, I see some of my students in the audience, that they see when I teach fundamentals of public health because while it shows that individuals and their genetic makeup, their biological makeups, are incredibly important in how we think about chronic disease risk reduction, we also need to um, think about what people's personalities are like, their belief systems, their health practices, and the various things around them that contribute to their health. And I also like this model for the series of degrees of health and well-being because it completely justifies why you can have in a six-week series a person stand before you to talk about immigration policies and a person stand before you to talk about climate change and then I'm here talking about diet. It really helps to put the whole picture together for us. And the way that I, I tend to sum this up is that your genes are going to load the gun, but it's the environment around you that ends up pulling the trigger. So our food environments influence how we eat. So for many of us, we're here in La Jolla, California. There's a basic expectation that you're probably going to be able to find a grocery store where you'll be able to access a beautiful produce section and 
you know, have a really nice chance at having a nutrient-rich diet. Now, Dr. Cassidy mentioned that I came here from Baltimore, and I worked in the East Baltimore area where the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions are, and right outside my office, and for many of the residents in Baltimore, this is where one purchases their food. There is not a grocery store to be found in that part of the city. The residents who live there are walking into places that look just like this. And furthermore, when you get behind the doors, you're purchasing your food from behind a bulletproof glass window. This type of environment really does affect individuals' ability to adhere to the gui dietary guidelines that we have and it essentially will affect their health outcomes down the road. So some of these, some communities are disproportionately facing health hazards. Um, I mentioned, you know, a situation that's going on right now in our country in Flint, but often this is broken down by socioeconomic status where areas that have higher socioeconomic status have decreased exposure to pollutants, whether they be from air, water, or soil. They have less fast food restaurants in their areas, less liquor stores, and access to grocery stores, in contrast to what you might see in lower socioeconomic status um, communities. Now, I mentioned before, this affects people's ability to adhere to the guidelines. What are the guidelines? Well, in order for people to experience good health, the current guidelines suggest that you should be able to follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. So whether you're aged two or 92, you should be able to have a nutrient-rich diet. It should be include a variety of foods, and the amount of foods that you eat should be taken into account. It also asks that people limit calories from added sugars and saturated fats and reduce sodium intake. And reducing sodium intake is you know, part of my research program, so I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But also shift from a healthier, shift to a healthier food and beverage choice and think about what your preferences are, whether those be driven by culture or by other personal um, factors. And then it suggests that we all need to be involved in supporting healthy patterns of eating. Now, why does it matter that these guidelines are out there? Well, when people adhere to guidelines, data suggests that they actually have better outcomes. And there are growing data showing that people who are guideline adherent have lower waist circumference, they have lower insulin resistance, which is a risk factor for uh, type 2 diabetes, the odds of carotid atherosclerosis are reduced, and the odds of death and cardiovascular disease mortality are also reduced. So within that vein, in that backdrop, with that context, um, a part of the, the work that I do and a study that I recently conducted was this trial where we wanted to try and assist the general public in achieving and maintaining the currently recommended sodium intake. Right? And we chose to do that through uh, an intervention that really focused on flavoring foods with spices and herbs and trying to get people to maintain the things that we were able to do with those foods at home. Now, some of you may be thinking, I've heard a lot about fat, and I know I should be watching that. I've heard a lot about sugar, but salt? I haven't really heard much about the fact that I should be paying attention to salt. So let me show you the conceptual framework um, that really um, helps me to think about this work. So when people have excessive sodium intake, salt activates a variety of neural, endocrine, and paracrine mechanisms that lead to a rise in blood pressure. And high blood pressure, is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease and for chronic kidney disease. And even independent of effects on blood pressure, there are mechanisms by which excessive salt intake can increase your chances of getting heart disease. That could be through increasing blood volume, dilating the arteries, or increasing the preload. Now, the types of evidence that link dietary sodium to uh, blood pressure are actually quite extensive and quite concordant. The body of literature is, is, is large. So our study wasn't focusing on the relationship between sodium and blood pressure. It was focusing on how do we get people adherent to the sodium um, intake. Essentially, to sum up what you see on the screen here, there's a very direct and progressive relationship between sodium and blood pressure. And when you intervene on dietary sodium intake in terms of bringing it lower, blood pressure also is lower. Based on this evidence, 
which I should interject here, is not without debate. And I think debate in science is actually quite healthy. Um, the premise of the debate is, why not extend beyond blood pressure as an outcome when thinking about dietary sodium and what we should do with it? And the, one of the reasons the literature is focused mostly on blood pressure is that it becomes quite impractical and costly to do dietary studies that rely on people experiencing hard clinical out endpoints. So based on the blood pressure literature, there have been a number of major medical and public health authoritative agencies that have come together to put forward sodium guidelines. And these agencies include the World Health Organization, they include the Institute of Medicine, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, as well as the U US Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committees. And as you can see outlined on this um, screen, these uh, guidelines include having an upper limit of dietary sodium intake, not a consumption level, but an upper limit of no more than 2,000, and some agencies go up a little bit more to about 2,400 milligrams per day. Now, I want to tell you, everyone needs a little bit of sodium. Sodium is a necessary for physiologic function. The amount of sodium that's necessary for physiologic function ranges from about 200 to 500 milligrams per day. Okay, so these levels are much in excess of that. When we think about adequacy or adequate intakes in the diet, a diet that provides all of the other nutrients that are recommended at 1,500 milligrams of sodium should be adequately providing everything else that you need. And these guidelines are, again, even above what we would think of when we think about adequate intakes. So I've been talking for a little bit now, and I've learned um, that the best way to interact with an audience is to have some time for active participation. So I'm going to throw in a little bit of a pop quiz. You just saw the adequate intake, well, the uh, upper limit for intake for dietary sodium. So I'm going to ask you to think about what do you think in terms of the percent of people in this country based on age and sex who are at um, the usual, above the usual intake of, of sodium? OK, I heard 75, I heard 80. 85%. Wow, OK, so those are, are actually really good guesses. So the best case scenario, um, as shown on this figure, are females, 71 years or older, who for whom 60% of that age group, uh, age sex group, are over the upper limit. And for everyone else, it's upwards of 80%. So this is a real challenge um, in, in, in public health and something that I have been uh, working towards addressing. Now, why is that? Why is it that so many people exceed the upper uh, limit of recommendation for dietary sodium intake? Well, it turns out sodium's ubiquitous in our food supply. And these are data that show the nine categories or so that we can lump almost every single food in the food supply into. And with the exception of this little sliver here of fruits and fruit juices, although there's very little sodium that occurs naturally in foods, you find sodium in every other category. And the reason is that we use it in commercially processing of foods, and in the consumption patterns that Americans have, it shows up um, just about everywhere. Okay, one more pop quiz for you before we go ahead. How many people do you think, what percent of people do you think can either underestimate or can't estimate the amount of sodium that they're eating? 80? 100, OK, so between 80 and 100, all right? And then what percent of, of the American population do you think are trying to reduce their dietary sodium intake? OK, OK, this is actually a, a, not, a, not a bad guess. So uh, consumer research tells us that, yeah, roughly 100%, all of us, 97% of people as, can't estimate or underestimate how much sodium they're eating. And almost 60% have tried. The strategy that they're trying is to actually use less salt when they're um, cooking their foods or sitting to have a meal. But as I just mentioned before, a lot of this is in foods that have already been prepared for us, and so it makes it very difficult for individuals when they're trying with that approach to actually get to the recommended amounts. 
So in our study, we recruited individuals who were healthy, roughly, re relatively speaking, but for whom a 1,500 milligram per day recommendation applied. And these are individuals who have hypertension or prehypertension, type 2 diabetes, who are African American or over 51 years of age. They had to be 18 years of age or older, and again, roughly generalizable. We didn't want to have too many restrictions on, on who we brought into the study so that it would then be able to um, be applied uh, out widely. We excluded those who didn't meet the age criteria who were pregnant, or I'll show you why this is important in a minute, who had food allergies or preferences for their, their foods that they eat. So here's the design. We took individuals in the first four weeks of study and did a controlled feeding experiment where every single person who enrolled in the study were given study diets and were not allowed to consume anything outside of what we provided. All foods, all beverages provided for them. At the end of, of four weeks, they then were randomized to a control group where they got advice only or an intervention group which emphasized spices and herbs. And this period of study went on for an additional 20 weeks so that the study was uh, 24 weeks in, in full duration. As a means of trying to understand the impact of the, the work that we were doing, we collected 24-hour urine samples, which gives us a really good sense of how much sodium people are eating. That's pretty much one-to-one. -one. What you consume will come out in the urine if the kidneys are working um, as they should. We call this first phase of the study the getting started phase. And as I would have staff meetings and um, talk about the study, I encourage the staff to think about it you know, through the eyes of a, a, a common proverb that you may have heard. And it was, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And that was sort of the principle that we were operating under. It was initially we were going to give people food and show them exactly what they needed to do and how they needed to eat to get to the recommended amount of sodium. And then we transfer those skills to those individuals and see what they could do um, on their own. So let's, let me tell you about what we did in this first phase. So here are sample, um, two days of sample menus of the foods that we fed. And the whole idea was this would not be a Gucci loafer type diet. You know, you should be able to go into any typical grocery store and pick up these foods and be able to, to meet these goals. Well, take a look at day two uh, lunch. So here we have a tomato basil soup with grilled cheese and, and coleslaw. Now, I see some of my, my friends in the audience. If you ever took me for lunch, I would never order soup and grilled cheese in the same sitting. I know for sure that's going to put me above my daily allowance for dietary sodium. But here in this study, we, again, we wanted to give people um, options for things that we thought would be sustainable and for, that they could adopt. And I said to the staff, let's give it a try. Well, guess what happened when we gave it a try? Of course, we had to make that soup completely from scratch. Um, we were able to identify one low-sodium pre-prepared broth that we could use in, in our meals that would get us there. But we had to order it in bulk from Amazon.com because we could never find it on the grocery store shelf. Furthermore, we used no-salt bread. And you might think, bread, that's not a product that has a lot of salt in it. Well, believe it or not, in the consumption patterns that Americans have, it becomes the category of food that contributes most to our dietary sodium intake, breads, cereals, and grains. So we use the no salt bread, which again, we had to develop a special relationship with the vendor to ensure that when we needed it for the study, it would be there for us. And what going through this process did for me as a scientist was it really made me appreciate what we ask people to do outside of academic settings, right? We come up with guidelines and we need to be really in acutely in tune with the level of effort that people are going to have to put out if they're really going to be able to, to meet and adhere to these guidelines. We also um, focused, as I mentioned, on flavor. And so we wanted to keep in mind what do people commonly use, and you see uh, things in our, our recipe um, books on onion powder, garlic powder, you know, black pepper, even salt. You could use salt, just not above what's recommended, um, that people would commonly have in the pantry. But then we brought into, into the repertoire 
more exciting things like cherry extracts and coffee extracts and repairing them with smoked paprika. And in Baltimore, you know, individuals are used to sort of collard greens with smoky meats like ham hocks. And we were able to take out the ham hocks, replace that with smoked paprika, and really get a satisfied client, um, which says a lot for when you can cook foods fresh and uh, really focus on flavor and use these innovative approaches, hoping to get some headway in people adhering to the things that you you'd like, need for them to do. All right, so that's our controlled feeding and a brief description of what happened there. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about the next phase, the staying on track phase and how we approached um, that. So we had two groups. Either you were randomized to an intervention group or to a control group. And at first I want to describe what happened with the control group. And this is going to be incredibly brief. So here, as would happen in the clinical setting, they came in for a study visit. We handed them a brochure that was prepared for them, for us, rather, by the Centers for Disease Control. It's called the Vital Signs, uh, Where's the Sodium and What You Need to Know. We said, go with God, and we'll see you in 10 weeks for a study visit. Right? Simple. All right. Then the randomization to the intervention took a little bit more work and effort, and I'll show you what happened there. So here we asked individuals to commit to interacting with us 18 times over the next 20 weeks. And that would happen either in a group setting, we asked that they come to four group sessions, and that they have 14 other contacts. And there was a period in time in doing behavioral interventions where we would have mandated that they come into the study center once a week to see someone in person. But not here. We've learned enough along the way where we could say, you can call us on the phone, you can send us an email, we can have a text message exchange, but there needed to be some sort of a check-in and accountability um, for 14 additional times outside of the group setting. During the intervention, we focused not only on the individual and what would happen for them, um, and those uh, areas included having them monitor their dietary intake, what they were doing with their recipes, how they managed their time, what to do when they relapsed. You know, everyone's gonna have a moment where you sort of fall out of um, the pattern that it is that you're striving toward, and how to think about this as a permanent change to their lives. In addition to those individual factors, we talked about relationship. What relationships, what happens when you have to negotiate the fact that you're in a study where you'd like to make these changes with your family or with your friends? And how do you talk to them about the fact that this isn't some fad experience for you, but that this is something that you're adopting for the long term? And lastly, we focused on the community that, that individuals are in. What do they do when they eat out? What do you do um, when you have to navigate through these large portion sizes that we're sometimes faced with? Understanding that the individual um, is really key, but things that are happening around them are going to matter as well. We gave them a few resources. We handed them a spice rack. They had recipe booklets. We did cooking demonstrations with them so that if we're asking you to try something new, you didn't have to go out and spend money to do it. We would do it in-house, allow you to taste it, and then you could make a decision as to whether or not you'd go to the grocery store and pick up those items. We also had made it fun for them. We had things like Battle of the Chefs. Um, our staff included dietitians, as well as people who had been very highly trained as chefs um, in some of the best uh, training programs in the country, and they'd battle it out to see who could make the better recipe that met our sodium goals. Okay, so here's our participant flow through the trial, and this may be the only time in my career that I get to say this, but I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we enrolled 40 people in the study, 20 of them went into the control group, 20 of them went into the intervention group, and every single person returned for a follow-up visit to give us our outcome, right? That's not me. That's attributed to the wonderful staff um, that really is truly committed to doing this kind of work. Um, but we had ex really um, incredible follow-up um, in this study. The participants in our study have the following demographic characteristics. They are roughly 60 years old, mostly female, uh, mostly African American, given our catchment area um, in Baltimore. And um, half of them were college graduates. Now, I mentioned earlier that this is a study that's enrolling individuals for whom a 1,500 milligram per day sodium um, guideline applies. And so 
these individuals do indeed have high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, they're on lipid-lowering meds. Their BMIs are you know, at about 30, and very few of them were uh, current or former smokers. But these characteristics just give you a sense of the people to whom the findings that we have may be generalized to. So I want to take a moment and uh, walk you through what's happening on this, this screen right now. This is a, a figure that captures the primary results of the study. So on the y-axis, we see the 24-hour sodium excretion presented in millimoles per day. Now, I've been talking to you so far about sodium requirements or sodium recommendations in milligrams per day. So I think it's important that I sort of give you the, the anchors here. So at roughly uh, 65 um, millimoles per day is the 1,500 milligram uh, re recommendation that we're striving for here in the study. At 100 is 2,300 milligrams per day. And up here at about 150 or so is the national average of sodium intake, which is 3,400 milligrams per day. So people in this country, on average, consume about 3,400 milligrams per day, about 1,000 milligrams in excess of what the upper limit, the higher end of the upper limit should be. On the x-axis, we have the time or their progress throughout the study. This is from the time that they enroll at, after being screened to the time we finish feeding them, or that very first phase. And here's the point of randomization forward for uh, the additional 20 weeks. So our feeding goal is 1,500 uh, milligrams per day. And magically, well, not so much. This is what you would expect in a very tightly controlled, highly compliant uh, type of study experience. The people that we fed did indeed come down to the goal, right? And both groups are being fed here. The blue line represents the individuals who landed in the control group when they were randomized, and the red line represents those who landed in the intervention group. The level of significance that you see here, um, less than 0.05, much less than 0.05, at about a 1,000 milligram difference between the intervention and the control group, suggests this was a very highly effective intervention. Okay. Now, it got lots of media coverage, got published in a wonderful journal, um, but there's something happening here that continues to annoy me. Okay, so I'll tell you the two things that bother me. One is, I fed everyone. The staff fed everyone. We worked really, really hard to make this happen, right? And, okay, I did hypothesize that there were things that I could do to help people maintain what we'd done in the feeding phase. But look at what's going on in the control group, right? Not only are they creeping up, they're probably, if we followed them for longer than the additional 20 weeks, maybe going to go back to their baseline intake, right? I'm not sure, but that's, that's troubling. Furthermore, the people who were fed they actually, they do better than um, those in the control group or the people in this intervention group, but they're still not quite at goal. So what's happening, right? It forced me, even in the context of a really successful trial, to be thinking about why can't we get people um, to goal? Well, that check mark pattern has been seen in other really well-conducted behavioral intervention studies. So I see Dr. Elizabeth Barrett-Connor in the audience, for example. She conducted uh, or was the PI of the DPP site here um, in San Diego. And you see, initially, in the first six months, this is a weight loss um, outcome in DPP, where individuals do indeed have a significant change from baseline. But there's this recidivism that takes place over time. Another beautifully conducted um, behavioral intervention study, the PREMIER trial, Again, initially, you see that drop in, here's again another weight outcome, and over time, individuals start to tick back up, and we aren't following them for extended periods of time to know what happens. Do they get back to baseline or even worse? Similarly, in the weight loss maintenance trial, we see that pattern, and in the look-ahead study, um, which is a study with type 2 diabetes as a primary outcome. Okay, so what's going on? I promised you in my title 
that you know we not only examine the problems that we have when thinking about diet and disparities and disparities in chronic disease but also thinking about some of the solutions so i suggest to you that we in an academic environment are really very good at constructing an opportunity for people to be successful and once they return back to their free living environments it's very hard to navigate what we have right now as a culture that doesn't really promote health. Okay, there are lots of barriers within the general environment that really prevents people from doing what it is that we're asking them to do. I pointed out before, place matters. So the individuals who are living here in Lakewood, they have access. Right? They have access to grocery stores. They have um, lots of industry happening around them that support health. Uh, good housing, but that segregation um, with individuals over here in Lafitte Trim, where they are struggling to get some basic needs met, really begins to you know play into this equation. And what happens when you don't have health, health equity is that there are really these you know unjust, unfair, and uh, systemic uh, differences that are happening that are preventable that influence the outcomes that people have. And, and when we're doing disparities work, um, we, I come back to this notion um, time and time again. Now, in terms of diet, you may be thinking, aren't we all exposed, right? Aren't those individuals in Lakewood, when they go out to eat, also likely to get too much fat, too much sugar, too many calories? Well, I suggest to you that individuals who go out for you know, a higher quality um, meal are probably having a different experience than those who are in neighborhoods where it's routinely cheap and convenient to access uh, various types of foods. So here is an opportunity to get what's called a, a BK stacker. It's three beef patties, special sauce, you know, extra, extra, extra for $1, right? If you have a large family to feed, that might be a really attractive option, or if that's the only thing that you're gonna pass on your way home, um, for you to engage in, um, in feeding your family. Furthermore, um, for individuals who routinely eat out at fast food restaurants, it becomes very difficult to maintain uh, recommended sodium intake. Here are data um, from the New York City Department of Health where after they um, started focusing on, on sodium in the city, characterized when individuals go into a fast food restaurant and come out with 1,000 calories of food, how much sodium do they have in that food? Now, it is not hard to walk out of a fast food restaurant with 1,000 calories of food in your bag. And in roughly all cases, you see that they're bucking up against that upper limit of dietary sodium intake, really just in that 1,000 um, calories of food. So it becomes very hard um, if you eat out all the time. Now, the New York City Department of Health also recently posed the question um, to their Board of Health, could we help citizens of the city identify foods that in that one food would exceed the recommended amount of sodium? In that one food, they would exceed the recommended upper limit of sodium. Right, so here you have some examples of an item that individuals may go out and purchase and what the amount of sodium would be in, in those items. I got this information from a colleague of mine who works in the health department, and not only was it, it shocking to me, you know, you look here and some of the things that you wouldn't really expect in terms of you know, salads, individuals are trying to you know, do the right thing, are really getting in, in the way. Um, what makes this an even more complex discussion is that while the Board of Health decided Yes, we will uh, support having an icon placed on those food. The NRA came back and sued the Department of Health. And it, they are now in, in litigation around being able to make this happen. They didn't ask for these foods to be removed from the food supply. They simply asked that we could inform consumers um, when they're, they're consuming these foods. So, uh, by the NRA, I mean the National Restaurant Association. So a part of, a part of the conversation is, um, you know, in, in food and nutrition, we deal with the FBI the food and beverage industry, we deal with the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, and then we have the NRA. <laughs> kind of fun. All right, 
further more um, to complicate the issue is it's not hard um, today compared to what we used to be able to do 20 years ago to end up with more calories um, and more sodium than we used to have simply because portion sizes have uh, grown uh, so much over the, the last uh, 20 years. Now, I said we'd talk about potential solutions, right? Accelerating uh, solutions. Every time I start to think about where do we start and try to address these disparities, uh, this, this quote comes to mind. And it's, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield. Right? So what did I do? I got out of the ivory tower a little bit and tried to get in the cornfield. All right, so I went over to the Institute of Medicine upon invitation to try and better understand what might be some of the strategies that we might use on a population level to reduce sodium intake in the US. Now, you're probably thinking, the IOM is not the cornfield, right? <laughs> well, what, 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 what it allowed me to do was actually to join a multidisciplinary team the team that uh, sat on this committee came from a variety of backgrounds. So we had scientists, we had individuals from the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, we had industry representatives to really sit and talk through what some of the challenges are from various angles in terms of making this happen. And the biggest uh, outcome or recommendation from this activity was that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, should think about modifying the GRAS status of sodium. And GRAS stands for generally regarded as safe. And what that would do is that because sodium would no longer be considered safe, uh, manufacturers would have to think about, based on the type of food that they produce, just how much sodium should be used in that food because it does serve a purpose, right? Often there are structural reasons why sodium needs to be in a, in a product, but it had been sort of also gratuitously used. Um, while I was on this committee, uh, someone from Burger King came in to testify during public comment, and she said that they had taken a product because they were anticipating these conversations happening at the IOM, and they had reduced within that product the amount of sodium by 75%, and consumers never noticed. Right? So we have this sort of level of exposure that's beyond sometimes what's necessary just for structure and function uh, within the food. In addition to thinking about modifying the generally regarded as safe status um, for sodium, the committee recommended that we take notes from our international neighbors. And in the UK, they had just started an initiative that was voluntary, um, where food manufacturers had agreed to, through a, a collaborative effort, start to, in a stealth health fashion, reduce the amount of sodium in foods. So you had big companies like Kraft and Conagra and Campbell saying, we will commit to reducing the amount of sodium in foods over the next two to five years by X percent. And this, again, is a part of a policy-driven uh, solution to try and get at some of these um, issues that we're having in, that are disproportionately affecting certain communities um, on the part of industry. I am mindful, now that I've sat in the room with industry partners quite a bit, that it's not that industry wants to provide America with awful food, it's that they too have barriers, um, whether they be financial or otherwise, um, to making these things happen. And so having this uh, secondary strategy beyond the grass uh, status strategy was really important in trying to get us where, we, where we're hoping to go. In the UK, while we were here, you know, talking about, oh, can we, you know, get our FDA to, to act? Can we get the food industry to, to do something? They had such consumer demand for reducing sodium in the, in the food supply that they were putting up billboards. And the billboard, this one is from Marks and Spencer's, we're reducing salt faster than you can say sodium chloride. But the part that I love the most is in the fine print here. Without compromising on taste, we're reducing salt from our food ahead of government targets. They're boasting, right? They're like, the government's likely to come out with something soon, but 
We're way ahead of them. We're ready to go. And that's because consumers were um, very vocal about the fact that they wanted a cleaner food supply. So you're probably thinking, you know, what can I do and why does this um, population-based strategy matter? Like, why are we thinking in the public health sense? Well, small changes can actually be quite impactful. And those of you who, who work in public health in the audience have probably seen either this slide or something very similar to it. So if before an intervention you have a distribution, in this case I'm thinking about systolic blood pressure, that looks roughly um, like uh, we see here on the screen, and you're able to shift that distribution slightly in the direction um, of improved health. Right? So here we're talking about shifting slightly to a reduction in, in, in blood pressure. You can actually have tremendous impact on mortality. So in this case, it's been estimated that small changes in blood pressure on the order of two millimeter of mercury. So for those of you who monitor your blood pressure routinely, you know, it, that's not, you know, considered a very big change. You know, for a pharmacologic agent, you might be hoping to get something on the order of 8 or 10 millimeter mercury. But just a small change, on average, can lead to um, a 6% reduction in overall mortality from stroke, 4% from coronary heart disease, and 3% total mortality. The amount of costs that are reduced based on that is actually quite impactful. Okay, so small changes can really, really help on the population level. Now, that's the public health strategy. I mentioned policies. You're probably wondering, but what about me? I'm sitting here, what can I do, right, to help us think about these disparities in health? So what I like about the new guidelines um, for Americans that are diet related is that it points out that everyone has a role. And again, for those of you who've taken you know, my course in Fundamentals of Public Health, you recognize this, um, this visual because it's a socioecologic model. It's a, a, a visual that we commonly think about in public health where we recognize that the individual and what the individual can do is important, but the relationships and the community around them and the greater society uh, will also uh, impact outcomes. So in terms of the role of the individual, Something as simple as monitoring intake can actually uh, lead to a, a huge change. Because once you start to monitor your intake, it's actually likely to lead to reading labels on packages, right? And shifting to healthier options within the things that you prefer will also uh, help because once you look for the healthier option and either you find it's not there, right? And you go up and you start to ask for it, what you do here in La Jolla, or we collectively do here in San Diego, impacts what happens in the state of California. It, happen, it impacts what happens across other states. Interestingly, when New York makes a policy and the food manufacturers respond to the New York policy, they aren't just making food for New York. They're making food for the entire nation. So those foods then get supplied um, to other states as well. Furthermore, we're in a global economy. And those foods are being shared in our multinational corporate environment and impacting the global food supply as well. So something as simple as making a request um, that it be carried you know, here in our towns and in our city uh, can be quite helpful. And when you go out, boldly ask for what you need to meet your goals. Even for me, someone who's very well versed in you know, what's happening in the restaurant environments, sometimes it can be tricky to be that person who says, would you mind asking the chef if he or she could hold back on some of the things that I'm not really interested in having in my food tonight? Right? That re really requires a bold action on our part, but that's something that we can do because, again, it's going to drive what that, in, what that restaurant's going to provide um, for clients that come after you. So in thinking about relationships, uh, something as simple as what, what's happening in our home um, can really matter. Are we having more home-cooked meals that we share with our families? And I talked earlier about the importance of variety and nutrient density across the lifespan. So whether you're 2 or 92 within the family, you should have the opportunity to eat well. And that's actually something that requires quite a bit of negotiation. You know, I have an 8-year-old. and. I never provided some of the things that you find on the kid's menu to my eight-year-old. So there are times when we go out and he's ordering the bronzino at $30 a plate, where I'm going, hmm, <laughs> you know. But that's because you know, we've sort of 
always had this sense of these are the foods that are, are healthful and are going to make you strong, etc. And doing that in the home setting can also be impactful because um, those things will, will carry over into to other parts of, of our communities. And thinking about family interventions versus counseling individuals on their own. There's a colleague of, of, of mine in, in, in the School of Medicine who does uh, family-based therapy for children who are at risk for overweight or obesity and really starting to think innovatively about bringing the family into the conversation can help reduce that barrier for individuals when they go back into their home settings. Now moving over to the community level, what do we all have to do with what happens in our community? Well, I like to think about trying to ensure equity in terms of where we all live, learn, work, play, and pray. We're all moving in and out of these various environments all the time. And the procurement part policies that we adhere to when we're in these various environments actually can have some impact. So I put here schools. As an active member of the PTA at my son's school, if I ask for us to consider serving something other than pizza at every single school function, after a while, the various vendors that we interact with begin to understand that this school would like to have something other than pizza. And believe it or not, they may actually rise to the occasion and be able to provide that. And again, once we start to speak out and use our procurement policies um, in this way, manufacturers of food will begin to provide the things that we're requesting. Right? Should there be fast food restaurants sitting in hospitals? You know, couldn't hospitals band together to say, if someone walks into a hospital environment, there's a standard for the food that we're likely to have available to them in that environment. And then moving over to the society level, this is more about those policies that I mentioned earlier, the laws, the implementation practices that really get at those systemic changes. So what's nice to see as a public health practitioner is that now non-traditional public health uh, groups whether there be the American um, Institute of Architecture um, or urban planners, are really thinking about housing policies, the way that we've segregated or not segregated communities that will really help to impact how we can get to a place where the healthy choice is the default choice. All right, so I'd like to summarize um, the topic area now around you know, the problems that we have and some of the potential opportunities for solution um, with these three parting thoughts. So first, as I, I showed um, in the, the slide showing the population distribution and, and making small changes, very small um, changes on average in the population can really have a huge impact. And so I encourage you know, those of us who are working in this area to not be disappointed um, if every single person can't make huge changes um, in behaviors. Uh, furthermore, um, health equity is something that I think is a basic right, and it can be achieved um, when we pay careful attention, um, we're dedicated uh, to the issue, and we think about this in an innovative way. We really need to understand what creates, what exacerbates, and what perpetuates these uh, health disparities. And once we have that understanding, we can strive toward uh, equity. And lastly, there's really a role for all of us, as I hope um, we've been able to, to see through, through some of the, the, the examples that I've provided in creating uh, a culture of health. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your time and attention.